Hello. Welcome to Applying Predictive and AI to Top of Funnel ABM. I'm Allie Klein, Senior Marketing Manager here at Rollworks, and I'll be your moderator today. First things first, I'm going to do a quick sound check to make sure you can all hear me. If you can please type yes in the Q&A box now, that'd be great. Great. If at any point during the webinar you have a question, don't hesitate to ask it using our Q&A feature on our dash. If we're not able to get to your question in today's webinar, we'll make sure to follow up with you personally. Uh, and with that, I'd like to go over what we'll be covering to, in today's agenda. So first, we'll be setting the stage for ABM, our framework at the who, the what, the how, and measure. Using predictive to target uh, for your target account list. Top of funnel ABM advertising, and then opening it up to a Q&A. I'd like to introduce our speakers today. First, we have Aaron Peterson, VP of Customer Experience at Mintigo. Aaron is joined by our very own Jessica Cross, Senior Manager, Account-Based Marketing at Rollworks. And then with that, I'll turn it over to Aaron and Jessica to tell the audience a bit more about themselves and why they're passionate about today's subject. Aaron, let's start with you. Thanks. So as Ali mentioned, I'm Aaron Peterson and I'm VP of Customer Experience at Mintigo. But before joining Mintigo, I was actually a career-long marketer and predictive practitioner. I fell so in love with what Predictive did for me and for my business that I quit my day job uh, and came over to run customer experience at Mintigo. So in my last role, I was actually a Marketo Revy finalist with my old team, largely based around the work we did with Predictive. And I'm also a Salesforce Women in Tech User Group leader for San Francisco and a huge customer fan of AdRoll and Rollworks over many, many years. So I'm really thrilled to be hosting this webinar together today. Thanks, Erin. I'm Jessica, again, uh, Senior Manager of Account-Based Marketing here at Rollworks, um, a business unit of the AdRoll Group. Um, very pleased to be speaking with Erin. She and I have known each other, gosh, I swear, five, six years now maybe, probably met at a market group, um, yeah, way long ago. Um, I as well have a lot of... Uh, passion for predictive analytics. I worked for two different predictive analytics companies, and now I work for an advertising company. So this webinar is very near and dear to my heart of a, a overlap of how those two technologies can be used together. So first off, I'm going to do a couple settings of the stage slides. Um, and I've given this slide a couple times now over different webinars and different ABM Lunch and Learns. Um, but just to like, get everybody uh, accustomed to what we're talking about when we say ABM, I first and foremost want to talk about, well, what do we mean when we say a marketing campaign? And truly, when you, when you break it down, a marketing campaign has three basic things. It's got an audience, who are we trying to speak to, the offer, what are we saying to these people, and then the channel. What is the medium with which you are, you are going through to speak to those people? Is it web? Is it TV? Is it billboards? Is it in person? So you add those three things together, and that honestly gives you a marketing campaign. Now, if we ABM, an ABM campaign is different because you're, you're targeting your audience very specifically. Ideally, then, you're personalizing the offer, ideally like on a one-on-one -on -one level to make that offer very relevant to your audience. And then they're using a hyper-targeted channel to reach that specific person. So it's, again, very similar building blocks, but it's supposed to be targeted and personalized. So for us here at, at Rollworks, we like to think about how we build our ABM in four core phases. So we think about the who, the what, the how, and the measure. And in this webinar, we're going to cover a couple of these. Um, but first and foremost, we're going to talk more about the who. Well, how do you pick who you're going to speak to with your ABM campaigns? Um, there's a no multitude of different ways to pick a target account list or the list that you use for ABM. Uh, you can do things like identify what we call your ICP, which stands for Ideal Customer Profile. So that would be you know, investigating things like what are the key verticals that we went in? What are the firmographic details of the companies that we, we turn into our customers? What are their technographics? That actually means like what are the, the tags or the pixels on their website? What technologies do these customers use that make them similar? Um, with that information, you can do some work to figure out what your total addressable market is. And what that means is that with, with account-based marketing, you ideally only are trying to sell to maybe a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand accounts. 
we here in B2B marketing, we're not Coca-Cola and we're not Ford. We're not going to be selling our, our goods to everybody across the globe. So we have a distinct total addressable market that we should be focusing our efforts on. And then next you want to think about how you prioritize those accounts. And then Aaron's going to get into a lot more detail on, on how you can even leverage predictive scoring to figure out the priority of those accounts. So this is some examples of how we suggest going about selecting those target account lists. Um, we have them tiered from um, levels of sophistication, as well as honestly levels of financial investment. You know, at the very bare minimum, we recommend going as a marketer, going to your sales and maybe your customer success teams and asking them, well, what type of clients are we winning more with? Is it in the financial services industry? Is it more in healthcare? Just some generalized questions on how to hone in on your, on your target account list. Then maybe one layer up from that would be you could, you could pull some reports from your CRM and try and score the data in Excel. Um, then another layer on that with some sophistication is working with maybe a third-party data provider like a, a Zoom Info, a Clearbit, or a Discover Org um, to help you build out a list. And then fourth, and honestly I think this is the most sophisticated and honestly the, the method I recommend is would you leverage a predictive analytics vendor that could do honestly all those three things plus with a predictive algorithm to help you hone in on who those target accounts should be for your organization. And with that, actually, I'm going to hand it over to Aaron to talk more in more depth about predictive. Thanks, Jessica. I'd love to dig in now to ways you can use predictive to select your ABM and target account list. Awesome. So predictive, whether your use case is marketing or sales or analytics, has pretty consistent ingredients and framework. Building models begins with identifying the business challenge that a customer is trying to solve. So not just I want predictive, but for the purposes of today's discussion, primarily around uh, target account lists and propensity to purchase. This can also be optimized, though, for high ASP, cross-sell and upsell, or even churn prediction. Components of a model, for Mintigo anyhow, uh, include three main things, firmographic, behavioral, and intent data. So when most people think of firmographic, they think of filters like company size and revenue, but these are really light filters that cause a lot of marketers, and particularly the downstream recipients of their leads, to discount the viability of channels like syndication and even sometimes display advertising and, um, and things like that. So the reason is they just can't get targeted enough. Top of, funnel, top of funnel campaigns and channels can be super powerful for ABM if you have a robust ideal customer profile or ICP, including things like what technologies a company uses, um, what jobs they have in their, in their existing employees or even jobs they're hiring for, or even things like what they spend monthly on pay-per-click advertising. There are so many different things that um, are super intuitive, but there are also a lot of things that are pretty amazing when you get into the data. Behavioral data is interesting not just in whether it happened, but also the frequency and recency of those engagements. So someone who downloaded your entire portfolio of content two years ago is actually probably less relevant than someone who attended a trade show and then a webinar and then downloaded an ebook all in the last two weeks. Intent is a measurement of a sustained spike in research on third-party publisher sites on a particular topic or search term. What we look for is actually a baseline for each individual company because what's normal at Rollworks or Mintigo would not be the same at a boutique cybersecurity company or a big five bank. And then we look for a sustained spike over that, indicating that multiple people are looking for um, information about that topic over multiple days. So how does it all fit together? Once you aggregate the data, you're actually able to use predictive to apply machine learning and AI. And what that generates is an output of ideal customer profile that can be applied to create a prioritized list of your best targets for ABM. Um, a personal anecdote, which Jessica probably doesn't even know, um, all the more relevant, especially with GDPR and all of the new security compliance things that are coming forth, is that when I was an Admiral customer at a previous company, we actually made a deal with sales that they would stop cold prospecting to people that were not opted in and rather give us their target account lists and marketing to warm them through digital and programmatic display. Um, the goal of that was to get them to opt in. We've had customers have amazing success at Mintigo doing cold outbound, but my preference, especially around security, is that we actually get them to opt in first. So within three months, over 50% of those companies had responded to our efforts, 
it was a huge, huge win for marketing and sales and a really great way to align the efforts and get them to feel safe working on this project with us. So before we dig into the use cases for application, what are the outputs of a predictive model? These are five primary ones we see across our customers. Uh, first is ICP identification and account scoring and prioritization. These are what most people are familiar with. But new markets and accounts are an awesome benefit. Knowing what's in your database already is interesting, but programmatic display using a platform like Rollworks is a really powerful way to generate new, net new, um, and knowing who to target is really key to success. So why are insights and indicators interesting? Uh, since nearly all of our Mintigo data is proprietary, there are a few things like CNB data that customers prefer to standardize. Our customers can ingest it into their marketing automation or CRM systems and then use it to inform their preferred vendors on their campaigns. So on top of the obvious importance of being able to ingest the indicators and insights for segments and targeting, it's really powerful for a marketer to say, hey, sales, it's an A, um, but actually layer onto that, here's an A and here's Y. So if you can target at top of funnel with highly relevant or personalized messaging, then pass to sales to affirm the same value proposition, conversion rates and the relationships between marketing and sales improve dramatically. Another application of this is identifying new markets and accounts to target. Sometimes the ICP in a model helps identify a new segment that a customer hadn't pre previously even thought to focus on, or it'll affirm that they're actually focused on the right target and just need more of them. And lastly, you can layer in trigger-based workflows or actions onto any of this. For example, alerting your CSM team when a current customer shows intent for a competitor's product, or when they've bought a new technology you can integrate with that might help make you stickier in the account. Um, from our own internal testing, I can also tell you that when an account has intent around predictive analytics for us, um, predictive analytics in general, but in our own data, our ability to secure a meeting goes up about two times over those that have not. So I was at Topo last week, Topo Summit, and one of the overarching agreements amongst all of the attendees and, and really a theme through a lot of the presentations is that it's not just account-based marketing anymore, it's account-based everything or just plain account-based as uh, one of our customers, Oracle, had presented on stage. So for marketing's contributions, even though we're focused on top of funnel today, this really means staying account-based throughout your entire funnel. Programmatic display is one of the most amazing and easy to measure, measure channels for applying predictive. While traditionally used to cast a wide net, predictive actually allows programmatic display to be used really effectively for ABM. Some of the ways that today's technologies can allow you to reach your target accounts effectively through this channel um, include IP address tracking, CRM data coming into that, and cookie data as well. And as one last takeaway, I'd encourage you not to stop marketing when a customer closes. Your happy customers are your very best advocates. There are incredible referral channels, and marketing remains crucial to their overall experience with your company. Um, my team knows that I love telling stories, and I think one is relevant here. One of our multi-time customers, um, brilliant marketer, awesome human, once said to us in the company all hands that Carrie, his uh, absolute rock star CSM, is meant to go to him. And so is Tal, our CTO, and so is marketing, and so am I. So he's referred us tons of new business, had strategy sessions with our board, provided product feedback that actually helped us create new offerings, and is now preparing session content to speak at some upcoming conferences on our behalf. So lest you think you should be hands-off post-sales, I would really assure you to um, keep these folks in mind and anything you can do to continue to give them a good experience as part of your community is of boundless value to marketing too. So here's how we would recommend applying this in production. First, we recommend you use account scoring to segment and target your accounts. We use letter grades so that they have a rank. You can also put these into tiers like tier one and tier two. And you can actually apply your marketing investment based on this. So tier one accounts would get a greater investment financially through bids and budgets, also in the time spent on creatives and optimization, and then be routed to more senior folks in your organization. Tier two accounts could receive lower investments per account and less bespoke handling from content optimization and sales perspectives. This, this is where things get really fun. So I was told in a stats class back in college that if you cannot measure it, it doesn't exist. So I wanted to share with you some of the simple measurements that can be applied to your top of funnel programs using predictives. 
First, you can look at the distribution of leader account ranks based on each campaign. Campaigns generating ranks um, of A and B, more leads from those accounts, would be better than those that generate C and D. But beyond that, you can also measure your vendors with, uh, actually provide your vendors with hyper-targeted ABM account lists. So this is actually an example from some content syndications we ran internally. And you can see that while a few links got passed around to folks not on our ABM target list, resulting in those C and D leads, the vast majority were engagements from the target list we provided our vendor. And in this case, they actually agreed up front not to charge us for any leads that were not part of that ABM target list. So we had a great experience as their customer only being charged for what we valued, and they delivered results that have kept us coming back over and over for more. This and is one Jessica of the – mentioned that the – no, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, just jumping right in because I get so excited. But this is one of the examples <laughs> of using predictive in top of funnel that I absolutely love. For some of us on the call that have a slightly longer deal cycle, you know, most of us maybe three months, six months, you know, we run an event like Marketo Summit that is a decently sized investment. You pour that list into your system, and ideally you can apply the predictive score across the entire list, and you know that, oh, say, you know, 60% of the people that visited the booth were actually A's and B's. And that's a great leading indicator on the success of an event or maybe the not so much success of the event. But I, I love this use case to try and score your marketing campaigns before sales starts even trying to work them. I love that. I do the same thing. I think for the trade shows, actually, another really cool use case is you can get a blind lead list Usually the vendors will provide it because it is such a significant investment. Um, you can get a blind lead list or use last year's list and actually look at the distribution in that same way, just to your point, as a leading indicator. Um, the other thing I've actually done, I don't know if you've done this, is I actually will run the, <clears throat> pardon me, run the accounts or the leads through my predictive model and look at what the characteristics are of them. So if I can say, oh, all these people are on XYZ technology and I get to do custom booth messaging, I'll actually adjust my messaging in the booth or it'll affect who I send. So if I have, um, I used to work for a company that had one product that had like five primary use cases, it was really great to say, oh, I should send this SE because they're gonna be able to have a meaningful conversation. Do you ever do things like that as well? We do have a lot of data inside our Salesforce um, from vendors such as Clearbit. Uh, where if we know that using a Marketo pixel versus a HubSpot pixel, they're put into different mm -hmm. pieces both for uh, like my Marketo nurturing as well as um, the SDR outreach. is tr We try to be, uh, we try to leverage those signals in order to give them a different experience. Yeah, for sure. One other really cool one I think that's particularly relevant um, to your customers, right, and to, to folks like me, is to help inform the content team. So another really neat thing is to look at the the sort of dynamics behind the ICP, so what's the DNA, right? What are the different things that go into it? Sometimes what we'll see with customers is that there's something present there that they really hadn't thought of, right? That there's a trend that people with, you know, purple hair are distinctly more likely to buy from them or whatever it might be. Um, obviously not purple hair in most cases in B2B marketing, but, um, but what we will do is actually use that to help them identify what content gaps they might have, and then they can create that content and feed it into platforms like Woolworks um, to be able to generate more net new. Excellent. I really suggest you go back and do some, what I think of some really good block and tackle marketing um, by defining your key personas. Um, we're actually going through this exercise at Rollworks right now. Um, I've got some draft personas that I need to circle around to the team. Uh, but the goal is that you, you identify who are the key people that are your decision maker as well as the sphere of influence that matter in getting that deal over the line for your team. Um, and you want to work through what are the needs, the pains, the conflicts, the goals, and the desires of each one of those personas? Because then that informs how you want to speak to those people. So take this for example. We've got a, a head of marketing here. Um, I just put down that potentially her needs would be to have an aggregate view of all the marketing campaigns and how, how marketing is influencing sales. 
a pain that she experiences. She, she deals and struggles with a lot of disparate tech silos, and she has a lot of difficulty reporting on the full picture of her marketing ROI since, you know, Salesforce has one data, Marketo has another data, Google Analytics has another piece of data, and it's hard to stitch all of that together. Her conflicts could be potentially with the CFO over validating the marketing budget, as well as with the VP of Sales um, to try and prove that marketing does actually have influence on the deals that close. Her goals could be uh, proving, again, marketing ROI, but truly her desire is even more to spend more time with her team and on brand development. So this is great work to do as a team, as well as maybe your product marketing managers can work on this with you. Um, but then just to give some more examples, I then have uh, mapped out a marketing manager that has slightly different needs, pains, conflicts, and goals and desires that then would feed into content that we would publish for this specific persona. And then lastly, we have a CR or CFO style persona where you want to ensure that you're still speaking to somebody within the, or, with, within the organization that might be what I call um, like the sneaky, like the, the detractor to the deal um, so that you have either a blog piece or email content that helps to convince that detractor that your solution is the right one for the business. So we actually have a really great customer journey mapping canvas in one of our guides that our content manager put together. Um, and we can link this out to you. There's a, a nice blog article, blog that we will link out after the, uh, the webinar where you can download the, the Canvas and use this within your own team to help work through picking those personas, filling in what are the pains, the goals, the influences for each persona. And then what you want to do is map that to your customer journey to, to work through, well, what are the questions that each one of these people would be asking along their journey into becoming a customer. Things like, well, why do I need a predictive vendor? What is programmatic ads? How is RuleWorks different than any other vendor in the marketplace? Why should I be prioritizing this budgetary spend over any other project that I have on my to-do list? So you want to ask all those questions. And honestly, the answers to those questions can turn into eBooks, webinars, blog posts, all that wonderful content that's needed to fuel your ABM campaign. So we here at, at Rollworks, what we did is we mapped our sales life cycle based on when sales reps would pick up a deal in what we called hunting stage. They would then move it to negotiation, then into pre-launch when the customer agreed to agreed to, to work with us, moving then of course into a live happy customer. We then once we were able to map all those phases, we could then layer on top of that our marketing phases from nurture, selection, activation to live. And I make them purple on the screen here because they actually represented uh, Marketo smart list that I was then able to sync over to my Rollworks house account. The idea being that I'm, I'm tracking when people move from one stage to next in their journey into becoming a customer, which then enables me to serve up different emails, different ad units, different messaging, depending on where they are. And what that can look like with the role works is that you have at the top of the funnel who it is that you're targeting. We have here two examples, a, uh, a marketing manager persona and then a VP of marketing persona. And that can sync over into role works using any one of our bi-directional syncs. And then you can serve up a different ad unit depending on who that person is as well as where they are in the funnel in their journey with you. Um, and this is all powered through all of our wonderful bi-directional syncs to get people to your website, to get them back to speaking with sales so they engage with you and you can really make great connections with those targets. So an example of what we did, this is um, actually last year before we launched the Rollworks brand, so it was using the AdRoll brand. But what we did was we built an ad unit that pulled in dynamically the name of the company. So you can see it says AdRoll plus apartment list is a match made in marketing heaven with a call to action um, to request a demo to speak with, with their sales rep. Um, and so what you see here is actually a screenshot of a Slack message between Kimmy and the customer, Chris where Kimmy was on the call, literally on the call with the client to talk them through the deal and what it would look like. And then he got off the call and he was served up this ad. He screenshotted it and sent it directly to Kimmy being, how did you do this? How did you make this happen? I want to do this. Um, to me, this is just a wonderful example of ABM in action where you know we served up a very hyper-personalized ad to the right person in the right deal at the right time. 
And while that's a great anecdote, what I can tell you is that by the numbers we did the personalized ad, we actually saw a decrease in our cost per acquisition, that's what CPA means, um, by 42%. So we actually had the, uh, the personalized dynamic ad running against a generic ad, and the cost per acquisition dropped, which is really great to see. Um, so you can see we had, the, again, the one on the top was AdRoll plus a dynamic company name, and on the bottom we just did AdRoll plus you as a match made in marketing heaven. So really nice results and just validates what I think we all know, that when you personalize the message and make sure you're serving it up at the right time, you will see positive results. I love those kinds of results because those are the exact kind of things we love to be able to put in place and measure. I think what you guys do <laughs> makes me so happy because it's, it's you know, easy to go in and have a vision for what you want, but that kind of really clean testing is awesome. Um, so these are results. Uh, just sort of a quick story from a customer of ours, a remote DBA provider in Broomfield, Colorado. They have an amazing uh, small but mighty marketing team and an enviable <laughs> retention rate amongst their customers. Uh, they came to us looking for a way to optimize their budget by increasing both overall demand gen as well as creating a target list of accounts with propensity toward high ASP. So not just which accounts are likely to buy, but which ones will actually be able to generate larger deal sizes. Um, in this particular case, they actually shifted their broader online search programs to focusing on A and B ranked leads only and resulted in over 40% increase in their conversions. So in this case, what was really great is they didn't have to create any new content or modify any programs at all, but beyond just putting the right people in at the top of the funnel. And Jessica, I'm sure if they were to do some of that personalization as well, this would climb um, even more. We should probably talk. <laughs> um, and then another fun one. So lest you think all leads and all clicks are created equal, I used to work for a company that sold an application delivery server to DevOps engineers. It doesn't matter if you know what that means or not. Um, what I can tell you is we did a lot of digital and display advertising, and one of the common search terms um, and advertising terms we would use was app delivery. However, every so often we would get a lead in that thought we offered appetizer delivery. So uh, we implemented something pretty similar to this, but this is a great sort of easy to articulate example. Um, this is for an SEM optimization campaign the customer actually did was put in place adjustments to their bidding, not just based on hits, but the actual predictive rank or fit of that hit. So the keywords were prioritized around those that drove the highest quality. Uh, as you can see, we're able to improve revenue by nearly 50%, um, and the, the ROI performance went through the roof. So this is another really easy example. You can, um, as we were talking about earlier, how do you treat your tier one or your rank A and B type accounts and leads differently than those that are lower? This is the kind of program that's absolutely worth um, applying that type of, um, of use case to, and you can get a lot of really great results. Excellent. Okay, time to wrap up. So what we went over in today's webinar is we talked to you about how to pick, or the who, how to pick your target account list. We talked a bit about the, the what, how to go about building your personas and doing your customer journey mapping. And I think Aaron and I, I hope we, you agree, but we gave you some good examples on how you can engage those accounts with a combination of predictive and programmatic display advertising. Uh, well, we, didn't, we did give you some a bit of measurement, um, but we'll save that for another webinar where we dig deep on how to measure ABM campaigns. Um, but with that, I'm going to wrap it up with some key takeaways that we hope you can carry with you as you go build your ABM campaigns. Awesome. I'll take number one. So uh, Mark Andreessen, who's one of the most respected venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, if you've heard of Andreessen Horowitz or A16Z, long had on his Twitter bio the statement, strong views loosely held. Um, sometimes this has also been um, transcribed as strong convictions loosely held. But uh, how this applies to predictive is a lot of people get bogged down with perfection, right? They get this idea that it has to be perfect, and what we don't want to do is have that become the enemy of excellence. So build a list, um, ideally leveraging AI-driven insights or predictive analytics, commit to it, and then take action. Give it time to be tested properly, measure it, and then iterate as you go. It's okay to start with something that's good and be willing to adapt it in light of new information as you move ahead. The one I will then add on to these 
takeaways is that inbound, inbound leads still play a role in ABM. Um, and what I mean there is that you can still use your traditional inbound channels with an ABM layer. So Aaron talked about how you can work with your content syndication vendors to make sure that they're only driving leads that are on that target account list for you. Um, they'll do it. It might just be a little bit higher cost per lead, but ideally it will be a higher quality lead in the long run. As well as you can still use display advertising just with an ABM touch by, by leveraging bi-directional syncs into you know, Salesforce or Marketo RollWorks can find the right contacts at those key accounts for you. Every yes is a no to something else. So we see a lot of customers want to adopt ABM, and Jessica touched on this a little bit ago. They're also often simultaneously trying to do everything else they did before. So Jessica and I both strongly recommend ABM as part of your marketing strategy, but what, know that when you do double down on a focused segment like this, you're going to need to adjust some things like your marketing KPIs and your budgets as well to set reasonable expectations. So the number of MQLs is probably not the right way to measure these programs since ABM tends to shift further down funnel with higher quality but lower volume. And you may also have to eliminate some other programs to shift dollars and to fund it. This is all good stuff, but just know that while ABM is the acronym for account-based marketing, it can also stand for about to get mess, about to become messy if you're not um, making change management part of your planning. Mm. And the last takeaway I'll give is uh, that ABM can be on your terms. So you can use ABM for just customer cross-sell and upsell. You can use ABM to expand into a new market where you know, hey, you want to win five healthcare accounts this year, and so you have a list of maybe just 20, 20 accounts that you're going after. Um, it doesn't have to take over the entire marketing strategy, but it certainly can be on your terms. I totally Excellent. agree. All right, thank you, ladies. Um, now we're going to turn it over to Q&A. Um, we've already received quite a bit of questions. So while the rest of the audience takes some time to submit their own questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So the first question here is, my company doesn't currently have a target account list, and the individual reps who already have a list think that theirs is great already. What's your advice for starting this conversation with my sales team? Erin, uh, can I point this your way? Yeah, totally. So um, I've been through this myself as a marketer, and we see it in a lot of customers. Um, sales teams feel strongly that they've got a great list and that their expertise in the space or years of experience are the thing that's right. And without more advanced analytics, I don't disagree at all. Um, or if they don't have account lists, they don't generally trust marketing to be the one to generate. The goal of predictive is not to tell anybody that they've got it wrong um, or that marketing is only people that have it right. I think the primary focus is to actually just expose that there's a lot of new information to support everybody. So what I would encourage is, you know, from a predictive perspective, find a vendor that will not only rank and score your accounts and build that list, but also one that will share the makeup of those scores as an aggregate in the model and also on each individual account. Uh, working through the change management is the biggest challenge, and making sure you either have a vendor or a services partner or somebody that can really help you get through that is critical. Um, and then showing that data, you know, the biggest thing is when somebody just says, I have a list, trust me, nobody trusts anybody, right? And, and you need that feedback loop to be effective. So I would really encourage that to be an ongoing dialogue. Um, from a really tactical perspective, if you want to go deep in it, I also created a Slack channel when I rolled out Predictive. Um, and I do this with a lot of my campaigns. And I let the reps ask me questions. I said, hey, you don't think this belongs in this account list. Show me the record or show me the account. Let me dig into it with you. And oftentimes we would find um, reasons within it that they hadn't thought of. And once we exposed that and did it in sort of a public forum, one person would ask, everybody would get the answer. And then they started to really understand how this worked, and it helped to accelerate adoption and ultimately significant success. Excellent, Erin. Really thorough answer, really great answer, so appreciate that. Um, next question here. It seems like Mintigo's platform leverages AI. Does RollWorks? Jessica? Question um, sure. Technically, yes. Actually, uh, RollWorks benefits from the AdRoll Group's uh, BidIQ uh, predictive intelligence, where what it means is that we have uh, a bidding algorithm that figures out 
which impression to serve to which person across the web. And we actually have quite a large volume of data that helps us do this. I think we've got something like 2.3 billion digital profiles indexed. That means the cookies of people across the web. Um, as well as then we've got so many advertisers that allows us to see different impressions and different people as they move from one website to the other. So we can start to understand their behavior and understand their different intent signals, which all, when we boil it down, it again allows us to serve up the right impression to the right person at the right time. Thanks, Jess. Um, another question for you, Jessica, is you showed a customer journey mapping canvas in your slides. Mm. Is that available somewhere? Yes, it is. Thanks for asking. Um, we can send that in the follow-up email. Um, again, uh, slides and recording will be sent, and I'll make sure I put a link to that blog post that has that uh, customer journey mapping canvas. I'm literally I'm using that canvas myself to go through the process of picking our personas. Excellent. How large are your marketing teams and how are they structured? What are the resources necessary to execute an ABM campaign? Erin, uh, can I give this one to you? Sure, yeah. So we're a fairly small marketing team. Um, we try to sort of operate with a lean team at scale, but our customers are all over the board. We have uh, marketing organizations that are literally hundreds upon hundreds, um, actually thousands of people. Um, in the case of some of our, you know, Fortune 500 or Fortune 100 customers, um, we also have really small teams, like the team um, at Datavail that I referenced before. What we tend to find is the most important thing is just alignment around the goals. So the size of the team does not have to be significant. Um, you know, I, I've operated predictive as a team of one in the past. Um, it doesn't it doesn't have to be heavy. But ABM specifically, I think, is, you know, it's how sales has done selling for a long time, right? Enterprise account execs are doing account-based. That's what they're, the, the definition of their role. So I think, you know, we tend to get um, sometimes stuck in the what's the right process and what do the right analysts say and what are the, the rules around this. But ABM and predictive can be done um, by small teams or large ones alike. Excellent. Um, and the final question we'll be able to get to today because we're running tight on time is how do you budget for ABM and inbound marketing? Jess, I'll turn this to you and then to Erin. Yeah, that's a great question. And I want to say it, it totally depends. But a methodology that I recommend um, is that you take a look at what the average deal, deal value would be for one of those key target accounts, you know, if it's $30,000 or $500,000 or $2 million, whatever it may be. But you want to start with figuring out how much could you expect to win or to, to earn from one of those target accounts turning into a customer. Uh, then you want to back out the math to figure out, well, if I want this many customers with this much average deal value, how many opportunities or deals does my sales team need to work? In other words, saying, what is my normal deal to close rate? Because then that tells you how many deals you need to be working. And then potentially you could even work the math, the math out one more level to say, well, how many appointments or how many meetings does the SDR team need to have to be able to create those opportunities? So basically map out your, your pipeline math so then you can figure out like what is like the, the cost per engagement that you're, or sorry, the value per engagement that you're comfortable with. And that can then dictate how much you're willing to spend from a marketing level to engage those accounts. Because ideally what you can do is, as a marketer, I'm trying to say to my sales team, I promise to engage 25% of this target account list. Or I promise to engage, you know, 50% of this target account list. With the idea that once once somebody has raised their hand, then the uh, ideal of the sales funnel will just flow as normal, you know, from SDR appointment to opportunity creation to deal closed, and that will get us to the number that we need to hit. So it's a long answer, but uh, hopefully that gives you some insight on how, how to run the math to figure out what the ABM budget should look like. Jessica, I really like that you mentioned the SDR team, too. Um, you know, when I first rolled out Predictive, we had an eight-person SDR team at the company I was at. And by focusing them on the very best leads, we actually were able to get 85% of the conversions out of only 50% of the volume. And what I think is so cool about that, really tying into ABM, um, that's part of what actually is a, a, a better ABM in the trust of the company. So we have three of those eight SDRs that can get this, this significant achievement of only half a million to use that best to promote three of those data SDRs into outbound BDR roles focusing on, you guessed it, ABM target accounts. 
Um, so when you think about the headcount cost of a salesperson in particular, they tend to be very high paid in the grand scheme of um, headcount you know, expenditures for the company. And being able to actually put them in roles to support ABM was the output of the prioritization, which I just loved. Thanks, Erin. Excellent. Well, with that, we are going to end today's webinar. We hope to see you in a webinar soon, and thank you so much for joining us.